1 John 4, 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, in God in him. Verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. So what we've been talking about is the love of God, and we've been talking about how we respond to the love of God and how we interact with him. And we saw here that it says that if anyone acknowledges that Jesus, and remember what we were saying about how God, God loves us and he has this call out of love, this, this voice. out. Remember how in the, in the beginning God said, let there be light? But see, God has always had a called out group of people. He's always had people that were special to him because they answered they answered God. They responded to him. And I think that in a lot of places, you, you, you can see people can hear. You know on the uh, road to Damascus when, when Paul or was Saul, he was on the road to Damascus and he heard and he's talked to Jesus. You know, the guys heard that sound, but they didn't know what he was saying. Only Saul could. Only Paul heard that. That was his call to him. See, God has a call for each one of us. He has a general call, but he also has specific calls. He also has very specific things that he has for just for us that are not for anybody else, very unique for us. And our response, see, sometimes when he talks to us, and I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but sometimes when he talks to us, you're like, are, are you talking to me? Like, because you're, you know, are you talking to me? <laughs> this is the New York style. But <laughs> you're like looking back like, like who are you talking, is it me you're talking about? Because you're, you're thinking to yourself, you, me, really? Because it seems like you should, like, I know me. Are you sure it's me? And, but God's like that because he sees what we don't see. He sees us. He sees not just where we were or even where we are. He sees Christ in us. And when there's Christ in us, well, there's no limit to us. And so when he sees us, he sees Jesus. He sees his son, Jesus. Now, we don't always think about that. We're like, well, it's me, Jamin. Not Jesus, Jamin. And he's like, no, Jesus. And you're like, what? <laughs> so his love is the love letter of God. He is telling us that he loves us. And how does he tell us that he loves us? Because he says, Jesus. That's what he says, Jesus. This is, this is my love for you, is my son, Jesus. I gave him for you. And so what does it say here in verse 17? Is it says, I mean, sorry, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. This response to the love of God has faith in it, believing it, believing the love. And it's so powerful that when we believe that love that God sent to us, in verse 15, it says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. What is that? That's responding to the love of God. I acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God. When we respond to that, God lives in us. And we live in God. That's amazing. And that really happens. At that point, when faith comes up and you just say, thank you, Lord, and you receive that, that love that God gave to us immediately. Because what does it say in the very first verse? This is how we know that we live in him. I'm kind of going back, backwards, but if you look, you can work backwards. Because I said that God lives in them and them, but then at the verse 13, it says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. So you see, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. 
So this is us responding to the love of God. So we looked at this kind of as our main scripture, you know, for the love of God. And then we looked at the garden, and we looked at what happened in the garden, and we looked at what happens when we respond to the devil and how that doesn't work out too good. And then we looked at God's call to Noah and how he responded to the love of God and what happened to the rest of them that did not respond to the love of God. It didn't work out good for them either. <laughs> and tonight, we are looking at Abraham. So turn to Genesis 12, verse 1. And we're just, before I start, I'm going to pray. Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, um, we just allow you tonight to just open up your word as we get in tonight and just open it up to our hearts. Speak to us what you need us to hear. And we just thank you for even before. In Jesus' name, amen. So Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the, Lord's, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family. This reminds me of all those guys that say they're going to leave America after Trump got elected. That's funny. Okay. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. <laughs> that would be funny, though. Okay, so let's start over again. Now, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So there's a couple things. First of all, we see God spoke to Abraham. He gave him something specific. And he said to get out of your country. So he had a specific plan for Abram. Very specific, very detailed, very well planned out. Very, I mean, to the finest little detail, God had this whole thing. Because that's the way he is. God's the master architect of time and space. He just is. And so he did this for Abram. Very detailed. And so what does he tell him? He says, leave everything you know, your family, your father's house, and go somewhere. Somewhere. Someplace that I'm going to tell you about later. <laughs> and many times... Many times when God calls to us, he calls to us to places that are unfamiliar. And that doesn't mean physical places, but it could be spiritual places. It could be people. It could be situations that are unfamiliar to us. And places that we haven't known before. And we need to remember, as God leads us, that we shouldn't hold on to the familiar, okay? And what do I mean by that? I mean by, one of the, one of the ways this, this is phrased is not leaning on the arm of the flesh, okay? The flesh. The flesh is like how smart you are, how strong you are you know, how old you are, your background, who your family is, who your kids are, who you know, your job. That's the flesh. That's leaning on the arm of the flesh saying, well, I have this strength, right? I have this strength and I have this financial capacity. So I have this strength or I have this physical strength or whatever it might be. And what happened with Abram is he was taken out of this familiar, strong place that he was in. Okay, and he's brought to this place that he doesn't even know where he's going. He left without even having a plan of what city he was going to arrive in. And not only just like, he didn't like get in his car and go for a drive, he took his whole family with him. He took everything he had, and he wasn't just leaving for the day, he was leaving his entire life. But God spoke to him, you see. You don't just do that. You do that when God speaks to you. <laughs> so, but we have natural things that we can lean on. But when we start responding to God's love, he moves us out into the realm of the supernatural. 
That's where he is. He's in the realm of the supernatural. He is supernatural. And we are supernatural. But we need to learn how to move in the supernatural realm, in the spiritual realm, not in the natural realm. But God calls us to supernatural things. And when we do that, we will need to leave the natural things behind. So God didn't even tell him where. He just told him that he would show him. And here's the other thing. Our flesh really likes to know. What is going on here, God? Tell me. I've, I've heard that you've, I'm feeling like I should be going over here, but I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Can you give me some more information? And what does he usually do? Oh, let me tell you. I'll tell you how it's all going to work out. Does he usually do that? No, he doesn't tell you any of that. He does it just like Abram. He says, go to the land. Because remember, we're responding to the love of God, and we believe the love. Remember, the good shepherd, where does he lead us? To good places. So if he says, come this way, as a sheep, how tall are sheep? They're this tall. How tall are shepherds? They're this tall. So who gets to see more? The shepherd. <laughs> so you just follow the shepherd, <laughs> and he leads you to the green pastures. So this is how God works on us. He, he, he'll bring us to these places. Our flesh wants to know, how's it going to work out? How's God going to do it? And God says this, follow me. That's what he says. He says, follow me. That's it. But guess what? Those are the only two words you need. If you get a follow me, you have gold. That is it. Follow me is genuine gold. If you hear that in your heart, follow me, go to this place, you go, because you know it's from the Lord. And this is what Abram did. Now turn to Luke chapter 9, and I'm going to show you some more of how this, how this works. Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. And it says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road. Okay, so this is Jesus now. He's journeying on the road because that's how you travel back then. As they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. You know, isn't that nice? You know, people, whenever they see something good's going on, they're all like, yeah, you know, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. You know, you just won the lottery. You have relatives you never even knew about. You know, I'm your best bud. You know I am. <laughs> You're like, I don't even know who you are. But it's just Jesus, you know, he's traveling along the road, and, you know, I'm going to follow you. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And what Jesus say to him? Man, you are such a good guy. You know, thanks so much. You can be a disciple. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Why'd you say that to me? I said, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, Lord. But... Notice here, and you know, I, I know there's a lot of other things you can notice, and you know, scripture's like a diamond, there's different facets to it, okay? So we're going to look at this one facet. Notice what he says, wherever you go. This person seemed to have a concern with the location of where he was going. <laughs> and Jesus found that out immediately, because Jesus knows our hearts. And so he was letting him know, you may not have anywhere to lay your head at night if you follow me. In other words, as far as where you go with him. Now, does God provide for you? Yes. Okay. But he's trying to show him what was it that they were, the disciples would encounter? Persecution for, for preaching the gospel. We will suffer persecution. We will not suffer lack, but we will suffer persecution. And he was also showing where the son of man was. Remember, he was our substitute. So where you following Jesus, you're following him to the cross. Okay, so this is what this guy was saying. So he was, this is the thing, wherever you go, if we let that get in our head, okay, you can't get that in your head. Where, what, what about where I'm going to go? What about this? What about that? You get that in your head, guess what you're going to do? You're going to turn around and head back because you're concerned with, well, where is it, Lord? Where are we going? Where's the final destination? I know you said, follow me, but where are we actually going to end up? You see? Now, can we trust him to lead us? Absolutely. But this guy had a little thing in his head, and Jesus no noticed it. That's why he said it this way. Now, look at the next one. Luke 9, 59. 
And it says, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. That's a good idea. That's a good son, he said. Good for you. Go bury your father. That's very important. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. You want to know he lost some members that day? I'm sure of it. <laughs> this is Jesus. Hey, look, I'm reading the scripture here. You know, if you, if you go to a church and then someone came up and said, Pastor, I'd love to help out in the nursery next week, but I have to go bury my father. And the pastor's like, let the dead bury their dead. Come and help in the nursery. <laughs> what do you think that pastor would be like? That's it. That'd be in the news. He'd be like, can I record that? <laughs> you know? I mean, but this is Jesus. This, hey, look, we have to be able to handle... Jesus talking to us, okay? And, and when you understand him as the good father and the good shepherd, it's okay to hear this because what he's doing is he's explaining to us what's in our own hearts. He's showing to us, he's revealing to us, these are the things that stop you. These are the things that if he, does he want us to follow him? Was he trying to get rid of these people? No, but he was trying to show them these areas in their lives, where if they were to follow him, there would be a problem. So he didn't say that. He said, let the dead bury their own dead. Now, do you think that Jesus doesn't want you to have a funeral? Well, of course not. But this is a specific situation. So think about it like this, natural responsibilities, okay? Jesus was letting him know that heavenly responsibilities are more important than natural ones. They are. Now, now I know you're going down the checklist of which natural responsibilities were more important than spiritual ones. But let me tell you this. What other scripture do we know? Seek first the and all these things will be added unto you. Right. So, and his righteousness. Right. And all these things. Will, you're right, Kelly. You got the rest of it. <laughs> she gets a start. <laughs> uh, so, so all of these things will be added to us. Right. So we can... We can seek first his kingdom. We can do that, right? So to follow Jesus, now do you think that it might have been possible that he would have been able to bury his father if he followed Jesus? It's possible. But his priority was off. He was thinking first, well, how do I get my ducks in a row first? Once they're all set, then I'll follow Jesus. Did you get all your ducks row in, in a row and everything all together before you accepted Jesus? No, you didn't, because you couldn't get your ducks in a row. That's why you needed Jesus. And Jesus doesn't even care about your ducks. He cares about your heart. Okay, so <laughs> your ducks get in a row when you put him first, because, but they're in his row, and they're his ducks. Okay, so next one. So this is, this is, this is a good scripture. Let's get you excited, right? Luke 9, 61. <laughs> so natural things will work themselves out if we're responding to God's love first. That's one thing you can take with it. Natural things will. Sometimes the, the natural realm demands of us certain things. And if there is the Lord speaking to us in a particular area, do that first. Absolutely every time. You know, we all have demands. We all have things in our lives that we have to do every day. But if we do his stuff first, that other stuff just kind of falls right into place. It just does. Okay, so next one, Luke 9, 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. So we must have company. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So he, I'm telling you, he probably had about three people left in his church at the end of these. But, <laughs> and they weren't even his disciples. But th this is, <laughs> so here's another thing. So what do we see? Lord, I'll follow you, but first... Let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And he said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So this call of follow me will require of us to put things in their places, to put certain things in their priority, okay? Does he say the natural realm is not important? No, but he said, if you're going to follow me, you follow him first. Amen. And it is hard on the flesh. It is hard because you, especially if you're type A personality, type A's, boy, if you're one of them go with the flow people, it might be fine. But you know what a type A is, the one that they want to have it, you know, I'm the command in here, you know, command, command, command. 
you know, and sometimes I flip back and forth, and we all have the, our moments, but, you know, you still get nervous, right? You get nervous. You're nervous. Your flesh is kind of cringing because you're thinking, oh, my goodness, God, where am I going now? Why am I talking to this person, and should I be praying? What am I doing, you know? And all of this stuff is happening because your flesh is just kind of working it out, especially, like, you know, when you first get filled with the Holy Spirit, when you first get filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and the Bible says that when we're filled with the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that we will speak with other tongues. Well, guess who's doing the speaking? We are. A lot of people expect the Holy Ghost to just move their mouth around. And they're so, oh my goodness, I'm moving, I'm speaking. Well, I can't even control myself, I'm flying. You know, that's not how it works. It comes up like rivers of water from your innermost being. So what, what goes on up here? Well, this is out of the loop. This is completely out of the loop. It doesn't know what you're saying. Your flesh, your mind has no idea what you're saying, but your spirit does. And as you let it come up out of your spirit, your spirit will even speak in English. Have you ever had your spirit speak in English? Your mind doesn't know what you're saying, but your spirit does, and you're speaking in English, and you're listening to yourself talk. I've had that happen before. It can happen because it's coming from your innermost being, not from your mind. So there is this training that we do when we're following Jesus. There's these steps that we go through when we're following Jesus where we put our flesh under and we give prominence to our spirit. You might need to fast. Okay, what does that mean? Do you have to do a Daniel fast? Do you have to do that? Maybe you skip a meal. Maybe you don't get seconds, but you do it unto the Lord, and you spend that time in prayer. Building your spirit up, becoming sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Now your flesh is like, well, you're not getting fed now. You're like, oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's not good. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> so this reminded me of the song, um, and I'll just read it. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And we used to sing that song in church. It says, though no, none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. And um, it says public domain, so I have no idea who wrote that, but it came from the Bible. And, and um, this is where when we follow Jesus, there is no turning back. There's no turning back. You just keep going. Because <laughs> you, know you know where we're headed, and I'll show you where we're headed here in a minute. But, you know, this is why we don't turn back. And then it says, no, none go with me. You know, look, look at this guy. He wants to go tell his family. What do you think would have happened if he went back and told his family? They would have said, what? You're doing what? You're going where? You're going with Jesus? Who is that? Isn't he the crazy guy? That's what they will say. You know, because what will they do? They'll, they'll get you to turn around. They'll get you to turn back and turn back to a, the way that you were. And Jesus is saying, I've got something that is so good, that it's ahead of you, but, but you have to follow me. You can only follow him. There's not seven Jesuses in seven different ways. There's, there's one way. There's one way that's the best way, and you can go that way. Now, God gives us grace. What if we didn't go that way for a while? Now we go that way. God always has a way of bringing us to where we need to be. He is just, he can do that. Even if you missed it for 10 years, as a Christian even, maybe if you just missed it completely and you were supposed to go this way and you didn't, you turn to the shepherd and he'll, he knows the shortcuts, he knows the way through the woods. If you're, wherever it is you are, God can bring you to where you need to be so that you're following on the path that he has for you. So, you think Jesus was being hard on them? See, these are responses to the love of God. This is their response. And their excuses. They and we come up with in our minds. And we reason, and we rationalize. We think of all the different things that we have to do, and we say, well, look, all right, so if I'm gonna do that, let's see how I can fit that into my schedule. And we get out our list, and we fit God into the schedule. And that's not, it doesn't work like that. Because what, you know what's gonna happen when God, does anybody work with lists? Okay, I, look, I have all type A's in here. All right, so if you work, <laughs> If you work with lists, which I work with lists, I have a good app, Wonderlist. It's a good, it's free. It's a good app for your, for your iPhone. So if you need a good list program, Wonderlist is a good one. You could share a list. Um, I'll put that in the notes. Um, <laughs> so when you put, how many people have like things that you have on your list and that has like a lower priority and other things kind of go on it and then the date keeps changing on it over and over again? And now it's like, how many months have I changed this date? Has it been three months? That's procrastination, exactly. And Jesus is not a procrastinator. But here's the other thing. If you do his stuff first, you have more time, too. You know, you do. You just have more time. And it's not always like doing stuff for the well or doing stuff for the... It's doing stuff for him. And it's spending time with him. 
because that's what he wants. He wants people to spend time with him. He wants all of us to spend time with him, spend time just talking to him, spend time in his word, let him speak to us, let, him just, let his word just wash over us. You know, that's what, it, that's what it does. It just cleanses our mind. It cleanses our hearts. And taking that time with the Lord. And you do that in faith. You do that in faith. You'd be like, well, I don't feel anything. You don't have to feel anything. Faith isn't a feeling. Faith is an action. Faith is a decision that we make. So we respond to God's love. It is a wholehearted decision, not a part-hearted decision. That's why that doesn't ever work out. A lot of places accommodate this now. A lot of churches accommodate half-hearted decisions. Okay, so how does that work? Well, it's, I have decided to follow Jesus, usually. <laughs> sometimes I'll follow Jesus, and sometimes I won't follow Jesus. And sometimes I need it to be a little more convenient for me. And, and Jesus isn't convenient to us. He's just not convenient. He's not like, this is the convenience factor of Jesus. I mean, look at how he's speaking about this. We want it to be convenient for us, okay? And he wants us to have the best. And so sometimes it's not convenient to our flesh. See, this is the part that is not understanding the things of God. This is the part of us that is, and it's not even food or whatever, but it has to do with the natural realm, our mind, our intellect, our emotions. It wants a certain feeling. It wants a certain understanding, a logical connection between the dots. That's the flesh. And that is not where he is. He's in this realm where none of the dots appear to connect, but it all seems to be working. And I have no idea why. That's the kind of thing where people can have, be blind in an eye and have God heal their eye where there actually isn't an eye there. There's just um, a fake eye, but they can see out of it now. How is that possible? But I know people that that's happened to, and they can see out of their fake eye. That doesn't make sense, but it can happen. Because that's the realm of the supernatural, not the realm of the natural. And that's where God wants to bring us. He wants us, but he wants us to follow him into that realm. Okay, this isn't something we work up. This isn't something that's based on, well, now you've done good enough, now I'm going to give you this reward. That just is a sheep following a shepherd. And he leads us to places that are greater than the natural realm, because he is greater than the natural realm. He made this. This is just the result. This isn't the thing. The thing is behind this, the heavenly realm. So this is where he leads us. Abram could have said no, but he didn't. Why didn't he say no? Faith was his response to God's love. He saw God's love, and he responded in faith. And faith works by love. Right? Doesn't the scripture say that? Faith works by love. So it's not always going to make sense, and there are things we have to let go of to respond. Now turn to Hebrews 11. This looks like a two-part message. <laughs> 707. Okay, Hebrews 11, 8. We'll see what happens. So it says this. Urged on by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went forth to a place which he was destined to receive as an inheritance. And he went, although he did not know or trouble his mind about where he was to go. <laughs> so you can just see Abraham. Do, do, do. <laughs> He's got who knows how many, you know, camels and horses and all these tents and all these people. And there he is. Do, do, do. Where are you going? I'm going somewhere God's going to show me. <laughs> they may like, what happened to him? But he had to cast down thoughts contrary to what God called him to do. You know, and think about how much time you save if you don't trouble your mind. Yeah. You see what it says? I like that. It says, he did not know or trouble his mind. Why would I want to trouble my mind? You know how much free time we would have if we didn't trouble our mind? <laughs> so he didn't trouble his mind with how God is going to do something or trouble his mind of where he was going. That seems, see, to me, that, I think most people would say that is not logical. And some people might even argue that that's actually not safe, right? Because what if you started stumbling into a bad part of town, you know? I mean, think about it for a second. Think about how we would look at that. We would. And if you, someone came up to you and said, God has led me to go in this direction, and you're like, well, I don't know if that's a good idea. Is that safe? Most people would because we were thinking up here, not from here. 
And I'm just saying, you like interpret this and say, you can't say that to people. Well, it's true though. You have to, and I, we have to trust the Holy Spirit within us. You think, well, what if you make a mistake? What if you mess up? Do you think that God hadn't thought about that? That you could mess up? You think God is like, oh, wait a minute, you could mess up. Never mind. You think he would say that? Did Abraham mess up? Oh, he sure did. That's what we call Ishmael. <laughs> he messed up, and we all suffered for it. We're suffering for it right now <laughs> in the Middle East. <laughs> Ishmael. And we can have an Ishmael. We could mess up. But did God say, Abraham, I've chosen you because you shall not mess up? That's not what he told him. And we know from the scripture that he was picked because of his faith and that he would teach his children. So Hebrews 11, 9. Prompted by faith. He dwelt as a temporary resident in the land which was designated in the promise of God, though he was like a stranger in a strange country, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs with him of the same promise. And we're not getting into all the details on this, but I just want to point out a couple things. The steps towards his destination included many temporary dwellings. Okay? Your steps towards your destiny are going to include temporary dwellings temporary places that you are along the path. That did not stop him from continuing his faith journey. Steps in responding to the love of God include temporary areas. And how many people have know this? Have you ever seen this? Have you ever looked back on your life as you've gone through your walk with God and realized there have been some temporary places that God has put you? Places that you were there for a time and then you went to another place and then you went to another place. And it does happen. And I'm not talking about church hopping. I'm talking about your walk with God, okay? And as we walk in God, he goes from, we can go from one place to another place. And if you think about it too, some relationships may have been temporary and that was God's plan. You know, a lot of times that's hard because you're like, you know, you have friends. You know, I lived in Oklahoma for a while. I lived in New York. I lived in different places. And I have, I mean, good people, really good people. But the Lord led me to go to a place. I mean, he doesn't do this like every week. I mean, I'm talking over 20 years, you know. And I can think there's about a half a dozen, maybe three or four times where I, it was a bigger change. And I went from, this is a big change for me. So I went from one place to another place. But there was relationships. There were things. And it's not like I'm like, ah, you people aren't my friends. It's just you can't, you can't keep all that up all the time, you know. And sometimes you move far away and it's hard, you know, you don't see people and they're temporary. But you remember, everybody is going to see everybody anyway, you know. So you always have to remember that. Even the ones that aren't even here, you're going to see them too. So we'll be able to visit everybody at some point. But we have, we have a plan right now. We have, a, we have like a job to do because people are falling into hell and that's not good. And we need to make sure that that stops happening. And, and, but we can't do that on ourselves. We have to do that by the help of the Holy Spirit. He has to lead us to the right places. So, you know, we aren't supposed to just like say, well, don't burn your bridges. Well, sometimes they just burn spontaneously. What are you going to do? I can't do anything about spontaneously burning bridges. They just, they're gone. You know, and we should keep up and maintain our relationships. And I'm, I'm not saying that. But sometimes there are temporary places and temporary things that we, we, we encounter. Some places we work at are temporary and different things like that. So, but it's on that path to the place that God has for us. And it's okay. And you say, well, what if this is, what, what, if, what if this is just one of those temporary places? That's all right. It's all right. If it's a temporary, like, do we think that this room is temporary? Yes, this is a temporary room. We are going to have a bigger room and a, maybe a more permanent room at some point. But right now we have this temporary room, and we're going to look back and go, remember when we had the little room and it was at the hotel? And You know, we're going to remember these things. But right now, this is a temporary place. When we leave, tomorrow someone else will actually be in this room. So that's okay, though. So as we're taking that step of faith, as we're going through that walk of faith, we need to understand that God will bring us to these temporary places. Hebrews 11.10. Because think about it. Remember, I, I alluded to it a little here. It says, For he was waiting expectantly and confidently, this is Abraham, looking forward to the city, which has fixed and firm foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So think about that. Abraham was promised to become a great nation on the earth. But Abraham looked past that. He was looking for the city of God, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, who 
God made that city. So as temporary as we think these little things are, guess what else is temporary? Our entire life is temporary. It's only, what, 100 years? You know, you go up to maybe one of those 110. That's nothing. That's hardly anything. So the whole thing is temporary. So we shouldn't be too concerned with temporary locations that we've gone to and temporary relationships we've had. Even relationships, our family, we have had family members, older family members that went home to be in heaven. They were, it was temporary. But all of it's temporary. But, but just here it's temporary. It's not temporary there. It's, it's, it's heavenly and eternal there. So he was looking for that. So God's call to Abraham was a heavenly call. It wasn't just natural call. This is heavenly. Remember, he told them that you will have descendants like the stars in the sand. Okay? What was he talking about? He's talking about all of us. We're the children of Abraham. He is the father of our faith because it was faith that he received the promise. It's faith that we receive the promise. Thus, he has become the father of all of those who are of faith which is us. So he has become our father. So we are part of the descendants of Abraham. So that's why you say, when does he see his descendants? Well, when we go to heaven. <laughs> so he's never going to see them here. That's why he could see. What? He was waiting expectantly for what? The city, which was not built with human hands, but was built by God. Can we do that? Can we do that? Yes, we can. We can see, not this realm, but that realm which is to come, the heavenly Jerusalem that comes down from God who was made by him. His foundation was made by him, and we can look that far. He wouldn't even be able to see all his descendants here on the earth, let alone all of us. So look at Hebrews eleven fourteen. Now those people who talk as they did, okay? He's talking about, this is the hall of faith here in Hebrews 11. So these are all people of faith. And so they talk. <laughs> people of faith talk. They use faith words. <laughs> now these people who talk as they did show plainly that they are in search of a fatherland, their own country. If they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country from which they were immigrants, which is overall, it's basically this whole planet, they would have found constant opportunity to return to it. So think about this for a second, even in God's plan. You know, when we go through from one place to another and we look back, okay, at what was temporary, it said, if they had been thinking with homesick remembrance of that country, they would have found constant opportunity to return. Think about that when you came to know Jesus. You came to know Jesus, you came into the kingdom of God and God showed you this realm that you did not know was there. He showed you himself. He showed you Jesus, and, he, and you realized who you were now and how you needed him. But all that time, you had a homeland. You had a place that you were from, a place that did not know him. They did not have a response to that call. They had the same call you did, but they didn't respond to it. And if we kept looking back with homesick remembrance of where we came from, we would find an opportunity to return. And we would have done what Scripture calls, we would have slid back in our walk with God and been in a place. We wouldn't have lost our relationship with God, but we would kind of be running, driving in a Ferrari and driving three miles an hour down the road. So it, would have, it just doesn't work. It's not what the Ferrari is made for. It goes better when it goes 200. So <laughs> just not, that's kind of a, that's a rough example, but that's kind of what we, that's kind of what we were doing. So we don't, we don't want to fall back and we don't want to look back with home, because I look back. I mean, see, there's a balance. There are things that God has done in our lives, and we should never forget those things. Those are hallmarks. Those are monuments. You know, God told the children of Israel to set up monuments in different places when he had done certain things. So every time from generation to generation, they'd come and look at them. But they didn't look back at homesick remembrance, you see. They looked back and said, God did this, so he's going to do this. If he did that in the past, just like David said, if he helped me kill the lion and the bear, what are you, uncircumcised Philistine, he told Goliath? That's the kind of attitude. So we look back at those things as a means for us to strengthen ourselves in our faith to see if God did it then, he can do it now. But not homesick remembrance. 
Not like, oh, I wish these were the days that we were back in. There's nothing back there. God's not there. Those people aren't even there anymore. They're somewhere else. You're here, and they are there. Faith is now. So they didn't look back. Think about Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife? What happened to Lot's wife? The things didn't work out for her. She turned into a pillar of salt. She's looking back at Sodom and Gomorrah. Not a good place. Not a good, not a good city. And she looks back. Boom. And the angel said, don't look back. That's a type. Don't look back. Don't look back at that life. God's not back there. He's with you. Follow him. He's in, you know, little sheep again, going around the pasture, falling off into the lake. Why were they doing that? They were looking somewhere else. The shepherd was over here. Okay? So this is what they did. They didn't look back. Keep yourself focused on the promise of God and God's call of love. So you were blessed somewhere. Great. That's where God was. Now he may be leading you somewhere else, and he will bless you there. You know, I th- I've talked to the Lord about that before. I said, well, this is a blessed place. He goes, wherever I go- send you, you'll be blessed. That's what he said. It's true. You see God's blessing in one place, follow him, he'll bless you there too. You say, but it's attached to the place. It's attached to the call. It's attached to the call. You can go in the middle of the worst place. I, there's one lady, and she works in uh, Mozambique, and she has orphanages there. And God's blessed her with what? Like 3,000 orphanages. It's like the poorest place in the whole world. <laughs> How'd that happen? Like I said, where God leads you, he provides. Whatever it is that you need, he provides. But you have to trust him. You have to take that step where you say, Lord, I trust you in this area. And listen, this is an expansion okay, of your faith. This is like where you flex and you move out further. This isn't something that you're just supposed to automatically, you should be, no, he is prodding us forward. He's leading us into, if you just go up over this hill, that pasture down there, way better than the pasture back there. You already ate all the grass over there. Go to this one, but you got to get up over the hill. Just follow me over the hill. I'll show you how to get up over the hill. You know, I can't get up the hill by myself. Well, good, because you have a shepherd. He's in front of you. Watch how he walks up the hill. Go up like him. Walk around that thing. Well, how do I get past this thing? Lord, show me how your path, show me your ways. Look at how Jesus did it. That's how you do it. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus spoke to things. Jesus used faith. Jesus rebuked the devil when he came at him. Jesus used the word of God against him. Jesus, you know, was able to to escape being harmed because the Holy Spirit led him to different things. People couldn't even hurt him. Follow Jesus' path. He's the good shepherd. Okay. So the blessing comes through obedience and faithfulness to follow his calling. Faithfulness is so important. And it's not faithful to a man, it's faithful to God. It's faithful to what God has told you to do. If God's spoken to your heart, and you do that thing. And God will lead you into different things. You may, I've had certain times, I was worth one group, and I was faithful there. And then the Lord, and it took me a while. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I went to the next one, and then I'm faithful there. And then he's, and, and it, it was just, you could sense it in your heart. The Lord was going from one to one. And, and don't, I, one of the things I always did, I said, well, I've been faithful here. What happens if I'm not here? And I was like, well, I'm the one that led you here. Don't you think I can lead other people there? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, so that's what we have to do. We have to be faithful to the call of God not just to a one individual, but to where God has us to be. Maybe you're here for a couple years and you go somewhere. I don't, I don't, I mean, I would love everyone who comes to the well to stay here forever, you know, but I want everybody to follow the, the plan and call of God, you know, and if God leads you somewhere, you go there. And if he doesn't lead you here, he leads you somewhere, that's fine. Just follow God and he'll lead you. Now, is God going to lead you to a different place every week, a different, a different congregation every week? It's like, like, well, this plant goes in this garden this week, but then we actually transplant it and put it in this garden next week. It's usually not like that fast, <laughs> but it does happen, and it's okay. It's okay because God is faithful. So Hebrews eleven sixteen. But the truth is that they were yearning for and aspiring to a better and more desirable country that is a heavenly one. For that reason, God is not ashamed to be called their God, even to be surnamed their God. What does that mean? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was his name. For he has prepared a city for them. So this is talking about these men of faith in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and some others. Noah is in here as well. So God's call of love is here. It's in this realm, okay? But it's a, it's a heavenly call. It's in the heavenly realm. We can hear it here in our spirit because we're spiritual beings. But it's a heavenly call. So God's love is heavenly, 
It's, it's heavenly love. It's not something that you, we don't create that here. It comes from there. It comes from heaven. That's the love that's in us. It's a heavenly love. The world doesn't make that kind of love. It isn't in the world. The world is perishing. It is falling away, and it will disappear. It doesn't have God's love in it. Not without us in it. When we're in it, then it has love in it. But it's heavenly love. So when we, what we believe God for here doesn't stop here. Okay? It keeps going. So we can believe God, okay, for houses. This is what we say at, at, uh, um, in Faith Life Church. They say if we believe in God for buildings, houses, lands, vehicles, and equipment. But that's not the final goal. We're looking for the city of God. The city of God is the goal. Not this, any cities you can make down here. I mean, how big of a city can you make down here? Is anywhere close to the city of God? I mean... Streets paved with gold, all these jewels and things on the arches and stuff when you walk in. I mean, God made that. God made that city. A city. Like, so he made the earth, but he actually made a city too. Have you ever seen that city? I'm not, I'm not physically seen that city. I've only seen it described. But see, we're going to that city. We're, that's where we're from. That's, our, that's where I'm from. I'm from there. I'm from heaven. You're from heaven now. It's like, well, where are you from? I'm American. I'm from heaven. You really are from heaven. See, we think about it now. We're like, I'm from heaven. Praise the Lord. I just feel a good feeling about that. But like when heaven comes down to earth and you say you're from heaven, people are going to like, oh, because they see it. See, we don't see it now. So it feels like some like poetic way of talking about being a Christian. But being from heaven is not a poetic way of talking about being a Christian because heaven is real. It's a place. It's like a planet. Okay, if you think about it like Star Trek, maybe it's like a planet. It's not like Star Trek, though, because that's not how things work. Okay, that's just fantasy. But it is a place, and we will go there. And what happened was, because when we came to know Jesus, our nature was changed, and we were created as a new creature. That creature, us, is a heavenly creature now, not an earthly one. Now, the body is earthly. That's why it's, it's like a seed. It goes in the ground. But the body we will have is not. It's a heavenly body. And see, this is one of the things that we are actually aiming for, is that heavenly body. You can sense it as, as, in your spirit that there's another body for you. You can sense that this body is not your body anymore. You have another body, and your spirit desires, the Bible says, to be clothed with that. This is like a tent. We have a house. This is the tent. The house is coming. So when we're looking at buildings, lands, cars, whatever it is in the natural. It's not even, I mean, we can get tons of that stuff, and we will, because when we walk in the fullness of God, we get blessed. But what we're actually headed for is immortality and being from the city of God. And that's where we're from. We can actually now, we can actually now put a demand on resources from that city. Okay? So, so you can say, I'm from um, Fort Myers, or I'm from Naples, and I understand that I have a beach sticker, Collier beach sticker maybe, and I can go to the beach at any time. Okay, so you have these rights there in Collier. And so you can go down and you can park, and then you, don't, you do not have to pay. I do not have to pay that, you snowbird. I have a sticker. <laughs> That's kind of how I say it. No, I'm just kidding. I don't really say that. We should be nice to everybody. So I have my beach sticker, and I just pull down there because I am from Collier County. I'm not from Collier County anymore, but when I was, I was from Collier County. And um, so that's something that I can put a demand on because of my citizenship. Now in heaven, we have citizenship right now. Not later, but now. We have citizenship in heaven. And so at any time... The devil comes up and says, Jamin, I have something for you. And be like, oh, what is it, Mr. Devil? It's this package of sickness. And be like, oh, oh, no, I don't have to have that anymore. Why is that? Well, I'm from heaven. I have authority over you, and you have to take that and leave in the name of Jesus. Right? Because in heaven, us heavenly creatures have certain things. The name of Jesus is one of them. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. That blood represents the covenant between God and man. So I just say the blood of Jesus is on this situation and something changes because now that covenant has been activated with knowledge in the spiritual realm. 
What does that represent? It represents protection. It represents a border, a boundary that Satan cannot cross because that blood defeated him, right? So where is my citizenship now? It's in heaven. I have things I can use that are better than beach parking stickers. I have authority now in this realm, in this place. This is where I have authority. I'm going to heaven. I don't need authority in heaven. We're all, we're all brothers and sisters in heaven. Down here, I have an enemy. Down here, there are things that need to change. And this, this particular realm of the natural needs to go from satanic to heavenly. It is up to us to make that change. It is up to us to take the heavenly things and bring them to earth by our words, by our faith, by our actions, and take this whole thing and change the atmosphere in our cities and in our country. You saw this. We all saw this. Just a couple weeks ago, people prayed. They said, we do not want leaders that are anti-Christian, that are attacking churches, that are attacking faith, that are attacking morality. We want leaders that represent God, that are, that are for things that are more moral and that are not. You know, we all prayed. And there was so much prayer going on in the country that all the Christians just changed it. They could have done that anytime they wanted to. But everybody said they pushed us too far. We decided that we were going to be who we are. You know? And who are we? We're citizens of heaven. But a citizen of heaven ain't going to be doing anybody any good if he don't ever put any demand on his citizenship. If he doesn't ever use anything that he's been given, you got a gun, you got something, someone comes into your house, you're not going to pull out your gun? Somebody tries to break in, you better pull out your gun. Well, I had a gun, but I didn't use it. You should have. <laughs> we have a gun in the spirit. It's the name of Jesus. And you don't even have to use it. You just pull it out and they run away. Because <laughs> it was already used. They're done. So we have to use it. And Satan says, be afraid of me. I ain't going to be afraid of you. Look, your people can be afraid of you, but I'm not going to be afraid of you because you're defeated. I don't have to defeat you. You're already defeated. Jesus already did it. So this is what Abraham was looking at. Us, the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the descendants, the multitudes and multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of people. And you know what? It is going to be neat when we see how many people there are. Because you think in this world, like, there's just, you know, in some places you go to, it's like you are the, like me and these three people are the only Christians in the whole city. There's some places that are like that. <laughs> you feel that way. But it's not like that. Down the south is not like that. But in some northern areas, it does feel like that. It's like, is there any Christians here? I'm one. I'm, I'm going to be a Jesus freak for this particular area. You can just make fun of me. Any mockery can be done at my expense. You know, <laughs> but, but, in, in, but in heaven, there's multitudes of people. There is the angels. There are the seraphim. There are the cherubim. There are all of these heavenly creatures and all of the multitudes of believers through the ages that believed God and received the crown. The crown, the crown, the crown. All these crowns. All these things. These, we're clothed with immortality. We're clothed with these heavenly utensils and these heavenly things. I don't even know. We're going to see them all, though. And it's amazing. But look, we use them now. We use our authority now. We use what God has given us now. We look towards the heavenly Jerusalem. But as we do, we know God has already done this. How can we be headed towards the new Jerusalem? Because we're from the new Jerusalem. Why am I headed to that city? Because that's my home. I have family there. I have a bunch of family there. I can't talk to them right now, but I can talk to Jesus, and he can talk to them if he wants. But I have family there. You probably have family there. We're going to see them. But guess what? In the scripture, when it talks about the church, it's talking about both of us. You know that, right? Whenever you see in the scripture, in the New Testament, it talks about the church. It's talking about the church here and there at the same time because we are the same church. I mean, there's no difference between us two, which is one of us is here, one of us is there. It's like, I'm talking about the church. What, the church in America and in China? I'm talking about the church in America, China, and heaven. He's talking about the church in the world and in heaven, you see? And that's where that comes from. So God's love is heavenly. We get first fruits here, but this isn't the entire crop. It's just the beginning. Amen? I have many more things to say, but I just saw that it's 733.
So we have to stop because it's getting late. And I only have this room for a little while more. So, all right, guys, thanks for being good listeners. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for all your goodness in us, Lord. Thank you for revealing to us who you've made us to be. Help us as we continue to follow you, Lord, that we would be doers of the word. When you prompt us to do things, we do them. If we decide we want to do something and you say no, that we just don't do it. And we just realize there's a reason and we're not going to do it. And the other thing, we're just going to do the thing that you told us to do. And if it's something we need to keep doing, we'll just keep doing it until you tell us to do something different. And Lord, we thank you that you lead us into places of, of plenty, that there's no lack in you. And Father, just as we go tonight, we ask you just your peace upon us and your presence with us as we go. We thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing in us and in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.